Hi there, and welcome to the podcast Life as a, a show intently focused on exploring and unearthing the details of professions and the people behind them. I'm your host, Christopher Schoenwald. Today, I'm going to start off by asking a couple of questions to you. What is it you think you know about the profession of teaching? Go on, ponder that idea for a second. I mean, you may feel confident based on the familiarity factor being strong from the sheer amount of time you spent around teachers in your youth and adolescence. Okay, hold that thought. Second question, what do you think it would be like to be a teacher in a country like Japan for over 20 years? Stumped? Well, put your mind at ease. I have a delightful guest who's going to break it all down and undoubtedly share some poignant insights on today's episode. Steve Hampshire is a teacher, materials writer, and teacher trainer. He began his career in education nearly 40 years ago as an elementary school teacher in London, working with many multicultural and multilingual classes sparked his early interest in the design and development of imaginative teaching and language learning materials. Following a year of teaching in Thailand, he returned to the UK, where he worked as a senior EFL, English as a Foreign Language, teacher for the English Language Centre Bristol, eventually becoming a director for their summer school courses. Now, for the past 20 years, he has been teaching in Japan and was, until 2012, head of English communication programs at a large junior and senior high school in Hiroshima. It was there that he began to work on a collection of original communication activities designed in particular to help teachers and students working within the traditional Japanese school system. This led in turn to the publication of his bilingual resource book, Why Can't Elephants Jump? He is currently a teacher. He doesn't like the assigned title of lecturer in uh, English communication at Fukuyama City University where he runs a year-round language study program for students ranging from intermediate level to advanced and summer training courses for Japanese teachers of English. Steve is a practitioner of the interactive approach to teaching and learning and firmly believes that education should strive to be meaningful, memorable, and enjoyable. He continues to design and write most of his own materials, some of which periodically make their way into print. Now, aside from teaching, Steve is the founder of the Seto Islands Project, a volunteer group focused on removing beach rubbish from the islands within the Japanese Inland Sea. He's also a keen camper, kayaker, and fisherman, a happy husband, and a proud father of two. Steve, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you on here today. So the first segment is something called Coloring Wikipedia. Um, listeners of the show might be familiar with it, but I'll just give a quick breakdown of it for you. Basically, it's a segment where we try to add some zest to otherwise dry explanations of professions. Now, Steve, we all know what being a teacher is on this basic level. However, I like reading off these Wikipedia definitions to kind of allow guests to fill in the blanks of what the definition is leaving out. So perhaps you could give that added insight after listening to the Wikipedia spin on your profession. Sound good? Sounds good to me. I'll give it a go. All righty, here goes. Teacher. A teacher or educator is a person who helps students to acquire knowledge, competence, or virtue. Teaching is a highly complex activity, and this is partially because teaching is a social practice that takes place in a specific time, place, culture, socio-political, economic situation, etc., etc., and therefore it is shaped by the values of that specific context. Factors that influence what is expected or required of teachers include history and tradition, social views about the purpose of education, accepted theories about learning, et cetera, et cetera. All right, Steve, what have you got? What do you think of this? Well, yes, so many hats. And, um, you know, wherever, wherever you teach, whoever you teach, I think uh, many, of the, many of these hats are inescapable. I mean, you, you mentioned here, uh, you know, a person who helps students to acquire knowledge, competence, and virtue. Well, there, there's a virtue. I mean, what's this? Is a moral behavior. So our role model, um, you know, there's a, one of the big roles of, of being a teacher is to be the role model. And um, the younger the students you teach, of course, the more you become almost a, a parent, a substitute parent. They say it's, they call it loco parentis. 
And um, so working down into the elementary and preschool, um, you are practically a substitute parent. And uh, that brings along a great deal of, of responsibilities and uh, indeed, um, you know, pressure too comes with it. So you've got your role model. Also, you know, you need to be a, a pragmatist. Um, and you need to be highly flexible. You need to be a humanist, somebody who, who thinks from the position of the student and considers their feelings, is able to be centered. You need to be a planner um, and a guide, somebody who's able to exhibit leadership skills, team building skills, um, a facilitator, somebody, for example, who can help students to become more efficient learners to become critical thinkers. One of the great important things of, of education, and especially as the teacher's role, is uh, not simply to impart knowledge about their particular subject, but it, it's to provide students with a toolbox to enable them to become better learners themselves. For example, be able to collect information um, to be able to process it logically, to be able to consider it rationally, um, to be able to discuss it critically. So uh, these, these are in, incredibly important aspects of being a teacher. Also to be prepared, um, to be flexible, to be enthusiastic. The list is almost endless in terms of... And, and let's not forget, let's not forget, to be a, to be a teacher is to be the eternal student. I mean, there's a famous quote, isn't there? It teaches to learn twice. And it's so true. There's, there's one part in this definition that I read off that kind of strikes me as well as being quite intriguing and, and quite interesting. I'd love to hear your take on this in the context of Japan. I'm just going to read this one section back out here. And it's, it's referring to teaching also really being defined based on the aspect of context. So it, it notes here, you know, the, the context of time, place, culture, you know, socio-political economic situations. Now, I'd like to dive in a little bit really quickly here on that point of culture, you know, in, in noting that you've been in Japan for over 20 years and have spent a great portion of your, you know, teaching years here. Are there a couple points? I know we're going to get into this later, but just a couple points, maybe you could... Uh, almost teasers, I suppose, of what that means, this idea of teaching within a country like Japan in a culture, you know, that is distinct and unique. Well, as a non-Japanese, I mean, I've been very lucky in my work in this country to be, to be given a, a fair amount of freedom uh, to work how I wish to work. Um, I don't think, maybe, maybe not all people get that luxury. Um, I have not been confined to operating as a Japanese native teacher might have to conform within the system. So um, I think I've been very lucky. I mean, in terms of working in Japan and its culture, of course, I've grown up, um, I've worked here, my children have grown up, they, they were born in the UK, but they came to Japan as very young children. And so I have developed my teaching alongside the development of my children. And that has enabled me, as it's been really great that I've, I've been able to see how they've developed within the system themselves and also within the culture of Japan and the, the, the pop culture, the, you know, the things that they like. This has provided me with an enormous amount of um, useful uh, information and knowledge as to you know who's hip in the in the charts and and you know some of the slang phrases and and what's fashionable and I've been able to use this in within my teaching to to connect with my students so that's been a very useful thing um, yeah I I think uh, you know th this country does ha obviously have a great deal of challenges for somebody outside of its culture but I, I think basically you know being a being a teacher means that you have a you have a very responsible a very clear job to do there's a great responsibility and you just you you need to get on with it and really quickly i'd just like to return to a point you'd made a couple of minutes earlier in reference to you feeling lucky in the role that you've had and the positions that you've held as compared, yeah. you know, being say a foreign teacher within Japan, as opposed to being a Japanese teacher within Japan. 
Um, we have a, a slew of questions on the way here to kind of get into the intricacies a little bit more, but really quickly, could you speak to that point and just kind of you know, bring listeners up to speed, like what would be the differences essentially, you know, what would be say a role that a foreign teacher would have or responsibilities versus say the responsibilities of what a Japanese teacher might have? Speaking personally, personally, um, I, you know, the work that I've done in this country, I've been responsible for developing my own course content. Um, a Japanese teacher is very restricted uh, because they are following a very particular syllabus. Uh, they really have very little control over what that syllabus uh, contains and very little control really or leeway as to how they're going to develop that content because they are working within a, within a, uh, with a group of colleagues who they need to keep in step with and they're all working towards the same test at the end of the course. So all their students need to be primed for that. So there's very little leeway for, for these teachers to be able to, you know, even if they want to do a little bit more communicative work here or try this new idea here, they feel under great pressure to keep it in tune with their colleagues so they're all in the same step. I have not had to do that, thankfully. I'm not sure that I would be a teacher in Japan if that's the way I had to work. Yeah, from what I understand, I mean, they have uh, in a lot of countries within Asia, but South Korea and Japan in particular have these massively important tests just before graduation uh, for third grade students that more or less determine their futures or the future of some of these students as far as getting into top level, mid tier and low level universities, colleges, and then of course, whichever colleges they do go to and graduate from will determine the tier of company that they get, you know, admitted into or hired into. So yeah, what you say, as far as the Japanese teachers being just so keyed in on trying to ensure that these students get high grades on these tests, you're right, it probably does very, or leave very little room, you know, wiggle room in terms of exploring and playing with content and being creative and taking risks. I think really that many teachers feel they just don't have that luxury, they don't have that option. I think many of them, to be honest, teachers I've met would love to do other things. Um, they, you know, and they feel, they feel very restricted by the system, that there just isn't the leeway or the space to do that. This might be a really nice segue to kind of jump into our, our next segment, Steve. Um, which is a Q&A segment. And the first question I want to lead off with, and it kind of continues on to this discussion, is you know, how would you characterize the education system within Japan as compared to, say, the UK or some other Western countries? Well, the education system here um, is very teacher-centered. Um, the teacher or sensei is, is really considered to be the source of knowledge and um, is really the active speaker in the room, in my experience. Students tend to play a much more passive role in the classroom um, and almost, you know, to be grateful receivers of knowledge and information. Whereas in the UK, there's a great deal, it is much more student-centered, put it like, the students are, play a far more active role in their learning. They're more responsible for their own learning. They are encouraged to be critical thinkers. They're encouraged to express opinions about things. Um, um, individuality is seen as a, a positive thing and a strength. Whereas um, in Japan, speaking out or being a little bit loud or, you know, look at um, me and I is actually not considered to be a, um, a positive aspect of being a student. So th this is a, a very large difference. Yeah, not only within education in Japan, it's almost just a cultural point, right? That proverbial yes. nail yeah. sticking up needs to be pounded back down, right? It's the group. There is this analogy, that's right. I mean, both systems, of course, are test focused. I mean, there's a great deal of testing in the UK system too, but the UK system of testing does allow for opinion and personal idea. Um, uh, whereas Japanese testing is, is very rigid. There is a very, very narrow skill set being, being taught here. And it's, it's really a question of how much can you remember and regurgitate. 
uh, from what you've been told, rather than a system of, of, of um, taking in information, processing it, and then coming up with your take on it. Right. The whole reflection process would seem to be something that is kind quite of- different. Quite different. Yeah. And this has, of course, major implications for language learning. Um, because one of the important, one of the very necessary things you need to be an effective language learner is, is an imagination. I mean, you know, we're in the classroom, but you have to imagine that you're in all these different places. So the bigger imagination you've got, the more likely you are to be an effective learner of a language. Yeah, well said. All right. Well, kind of shifting gears a little bit, we've been speaking to some of the points, you know, in a sense, maybe that could be characterized as a bit of a you know, negative point, at least from an outsider's perspective on the system. But I'd be curious as well to kind of flip the script here. And are there any things in all of your years in teaching Japan within the system that you find work particularly well, you know, that, that are going well, that are serving the needs of students in a, in, in a positive manner? Well, the system is designed to help the students do well in the system. Um, for its own ends. And in that respect, it does pretty well. Um, If we go to the earlier parts, you know, formative education here, the preschool, the hoikuyen, and and elementary education, both of which my my children attended, these are great. I mean, they're really um, models, I think, Um, the preschool stuff. Fantastic. Uh, really, and you have such a wide range of styles of preschool education here from, from your, you know, let's teach kanji before they can crawl to the real Steiner stuff of like, you know, let, just let them play. So you have a vast ar- amount of choice, very well equipped, and elementary education, as far as my experience is concerned with my own children, they had a great time. They were like a primary school classroom, uh, the same, something I was very familiar with, a very colourful covered in students work you know all together one teacher plenty of projects trips out great stuff a uh, really big fan fantastically efficient so in that respect great 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 guns okay no no i think that paints a you know really clear picture you know kind of the early childhood education would seem to be one of the stronger points and then there seems to be a distinct shift as we move into you know there gym. is the very as you come out of it, elementary into junior high, this is where this is you know where where difficulties begin for the likes of me anyway, because the system is very quickly geared to testing. It's very quickly, and um, it's almost like you've chopped the tree down from elementary school. You're planting the tree all over again rather than building on it. And the senior high school, even again, you almost chop the tree down again, because at least in junior high school, in, certainly in terms of English education, the course books do make an attempt to be communicative. There is an attempt to, to actually have communicative language work, whereas you come into the senior high school and it just simply becomes a, a grammar chase. And, um, you know, I, it's no wonder so many uh, students in Japan dislike English you know I mean I would dislike it very much if I had to have learned English like that however within the senior the junior senior high school system as your question was you know what really works well um there is a club system here which is you know sometimes seen as really rather is a little bit intense however the um the sport the level of sports here is, is pretty good and when I first began working in this country and the, the school I was teaching in was a very was a big baseball school it had a cheerleading club and a baseball club and the, they were extraordinary and I was very lucky to be able to go to um, the Japanese national baseball championships in Koshien which is um, an incredible event where these uh, teams of baseball, school baseball and cheerleaders and brass band working together in this extraordinary symphony of sound and action. And it is just incredible. I have never seen anything like it. It, It's almost unbelievable. It's high school. I mean, it looks almost professional. It's brilliant fun. I mean, as a spectator as well, fantastic. So they do that very well indeed. Well, I kind of on the heels of, of this right now, I mean, in reflecting on your teaching career, are there some other you know, particular memories which stand out? You just kind of, you know, illustrated one that sounded 
quite amazing, but are there any other ones that have been meaningful to you as you reflect back? Well, there are so many, Chris. I mean, there's so many things that have happened. Um, just fairly recently in my, my current work, um, I run a couple of variety of courses, but uh, there's, there's one in particular which are sort of more advanced English courses, and um, they're electives, so the students who choose them are usually interested in English. In the and they're, they're usually quite small groups between six to 12 students, and they, they're once a week for 16 weeks. So I've been teaching them now for 10, 12 years, even though they're online now, it's still live. And alongside, you know, the course aims and the course content, which of course I think is good, um, you need good student participation and good teamwork. And um, th there is a particular student who decided to take part, and I had taught him, taught this person before, um, joined the first um, class back in April last year. And from the get-go, didn't get going. And despite all my attempts to encourage mail and extra uh, meetings, I just could not get the interest. And this was having a very detrimental effect on the course. And um, I realized that he kind of, I'm gonna say he, but it could be she. I'm gonna use that just, let me just use that term because it's easier for sort of cheap points I think I wasn't really interested and consequently failed and protested and basically no no work no points you know so imagine my surprise when the second course began uh, after the sub there was this student's name again and the same attitude and for five weeks into this course it was just driving me nuts and uh, nothing seemed to be working and it's a small group so each member their their role is extremely important it's not just them it, it's a very teamwork thing however as I mentioned earlier teachers wear many hats and um, <laughs> I wasn't going to give I had a choice I could have abandoned I could have said right okay you've had so many so many choices we've tried so hard I'm going to fail you don't bother to come back but I, I just, I, something inside me said, no, this is not what our job, this is not, my, well, I'm not going to abandon this person. Um, I have a responsibility way beyond just this course. I have a responsibility to help you to become, you know, the best, a, a good student or to improve, you know, there's, there's something here that we can work on. So I invited him to a face-to-face -face meeting in my uh, office. And um, I asked him why, you know, why is this come up? And he, he admitted that he was really just trying to pass this class. He was going to try to gauge the minimum amount of work you could do just to get a pass. And I said, I was quite surprised that anybody would have taken that approach. But I said to him, look, you know, even in a candy store, there's a price. You know, you can't just come here and pick and choose for free, you know. Uh, and I just threw a question at him and I said, um, Tell me something, you know, what, what, what's, it, what's important to you? And he, strangely enough, produced his wallet. And I thought, money? And, and I said to him, okay, why is this important? And he said, well, this was given to me by my parents um, for passing the centre test. And I thought, aha, here you are. The value in this is because you earned it by your effort and your hard work. And if you want something, you have to work for it. That is its value. Is it important for you to pass this class? And he said, yes. And I said, why? And he said, because I need the points. I said, well, if you value the points for this course, you'll have to earn them through your hard work. And really, since that meeting, this student has not missed a class. He's in class team working, making valuable contributions, smiling, doing his homework on time. And um, he's happy. The class is much happy, working better. So I'm extremely glad I didn't give up on him. And I think the message is never give up. And I think that's a job well done. Yeah.
So I'm really pleased. You know what? You know what? That I'm just listening to that. It brings me back to the Wikipedia definition and some of the things that you're stating about like the, those lists of different skills and different you know hats that essentially you're wearing as a teacher. That's and right. that one, that one to me, of course, you know, there's an educator side or perspective to that. But also, I, I can hear sort of like a life skills coach or like even a parent <laughs> or a grandparent imparting wisdom and advice. Like these are things. Like that's a lesson that's not necessarily geared specifically towards English, although in this case, it certainly helps. But what it is doing is like, that's a life lesson that's going to serve him well, you know, in so many different respects in his future career, profession, even relationships, and just about, you could name anything like that. That was a valuable skill. And yeah, it's quite commendable um, and, and quite admirable that you, you know, stuck with it right to the end and were able to uncover that hidden motivation that was there, was lying within him just needed to be pulled out by someone and uh yeah luckily there was somebody like yourself who was willing to do so and putting the time yeah I, fortunately i just tapped into that little bit inside him where he suddenly the light went on you and he realized that um you know i better get going <laughs> uh, and it worked yes uh, but it's you know good good for all concerned yeah, no, thanks so much for sharing that. I mean, quite honest, I mean, that was so good, Steve. Normally we have this water cooler story, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm conscious of your time as well. Um, I'm going to count that as our water cooler story today. It was that good, I think. So thanks again for sharing that. Um, yeah. yeah. So with that in mind, let's let's jump over into a new segment here, something called a crystal ball segment. And basically this one is we're looking at the future. Normally we look at trends within industries or professions. And the one thing that it's, it's tough to avoid within any industry right now is this issue of COVID. You know, it's, it's affected, it's turned industries, professions upside down, as you know. And in particular within education, I found from my reading and from my, my own experiences and people that I know, it's really accelerated this digitalization of education. So what I'm curious is, as someone who's spent a career honing and administering your craft in a non-digital manner, how do you see this metamorphosis playing itself out within teaching moving forward? Well, um, this is certainly COVID has been a real wake-up call for education uh, in, in Japan. Uh, schools have really lagged way, way behind. I mean, just I'm just reminded of my, my sister is a is a, a primary school teacher in London, and uh, she has been using interactive whiteboards and things with her students for years and years now. Um, the last time I you know, worked in a high school, they, they still chalk and talk. I think um, there's definitely going to be more online teaching in the future, and I think you know hope this has been a good wake up call. I, I think for many teachers now they've realised that they need to incorporate more IT into the classroom. They need to be looking further afield than just a course book and a, and, a, and a piece of chalk. And there are lots of opportunities to make education much more interactive, much more interesting. Young people are very interested in IT. I mean, let's face it, you know, they're online all the time these days. It, it's, I think it's a, actually a very positive thing. Um, I, and I hope that the education system in Japan is able to embrace it. One of the potential problems, of course, is that it's still so focused on the exam system, which requires such a narrow skill set that it's, again, with online and now with, with, with COVID forcing a lot of education online, one of the dangers is that it's so easy to go down the on-demand route and simply provide um, pre-recorded PowerPoint lessons to students who are already feeling isolated. Uh, some of them, you know, must be thinking, my goodness, even the old chalk talk stuff was, was better than this because at least I was with my mate. I'm hoping that this is not going to happen. I, mean, I have found going online um, initially, it was a real learning curve, very, very steep. I'd never considered it. It suddenly happened. We were given two weeks to get ready to go from to a, you know, how many years I've been doing this to an online format. As a materials writer, actually, uh, I, I just took it day by day and found it to be an extremely interesting process um, of, of looking again at my materials and thinking how I can use them, how I can make this as live as possible. And I, all my classes that are online, they're all in real time. 
Um, and fortunately, Zoom came along, um, you know, miraculously. Um, but I, I've actually found that it's um, been a really interesting process um, of um, developing my work. And one of the very positive things that's happened as a result of having to go online is that I've, again, looked again at the work. And because you can't give worksheets out now, you have to send them digitally. I've started to redesign things so that each one has homework embedded, whereby students have to prepare things, uh, and warmers or co collect ideas prior to class. So I've actually involved them in much more out of class time than I did before. So it's had that positive effect. Um, I also like just listening to you as well right now, kind of spark some ideas about all of this work. I think, you know, like for yourself and for a lot of teachers, of course, too, is they, they had, you know, you had your, your set routines, you had your materials all prepared prior to all of this. And I think for anyone in any profession, you do things over and over again. Of course, you can perfect it. You can get those nice routines down. But then also, I think one of the byproducts of that or dangers even could be that you lose that. I don't know. Again, I'm going to use that word spark. Yes, you can come you can become complacent. Yeah, you become a little complacent by it. Whereas something like this, it kind of, in a way, it would seem to energize, or it could, has a potential to energize teachers. Absolutely true. You know, rediscover the profession. I totally agree. For, for me, it had that effect of actually energizing me. I, I mean, I don't like to attach anything positive to go to the COVID, but it, it actually did have that effect on me and it gave me a new energy uh, within you know my profession to actually look again at things that I do and reevaluate things that I do so for me it was uh, it's it's proved very productive I, I just I hope that that this is also the case for other teachers um, in this country and they don't simply just go down the on-demand route which of course is the easiest thing to do the the opportunities are there that's such a fascinating take, man. I really thank you for sharing that. I think that's going to give people that view on things and uh, an understanding of it. And I think a lot of these issues that we've spoken about are probably not entirely limited to Japan in terms of this this last point that we were just on. But, um, but yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And again, I'm quite conscious of your time here today, Steve. So I think we're going to draw this to a close, but it's been a true, true pleasure. And I do thank you immensely for joining us on the show. Well, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it. Now, for those interested in learning more about Steve and his work, you can search for some of his published works like Why Can't Elephants Jump at www.englishbooks.jp. You can also find and connect with him through his Seto Islands project or on Facebook and Instagram. And if you missed it, this information will be included in the show notes. Also, if you like today's show, be sure to tell a friend and share. To show support, you can rate, review, and subscribe wherever you access your podcasts. And don't forget to join us for the next episode of Life as a, where we'll continue to explore and unearth the details of professions and the people behind them. I'm Christopher Schoenwald, your host, and until next time, stay curious about life and living. Thank you.